astounding wisdom in the traditional Jewish Sabbath, that it begins precisely at sundown, whether that comes at a wintry 4.30 or a late on a summer evening. Sabbath is not dependent on our readiness to stop. We do not stop when we are finished. We do not stop when we complete our phone calls, finish our project, get through this stack of messages, or get out this report that is due tomorrow. We stop because it is time to stop. Sabbath requires surrender. If we only stop when we are finished with all of our work, we will never stop because our work is never completely done. With every accomplishment, there arises a new responsibility. Every swept floor invites another sweeping. Every child bathed invites another bathing. When all life moves in such cycles, what is ever finished? The sun goes round, the moon goes round, the tides and seasons go round, people are born and die, and when are we finished? If we refuse rest until we are finished, we will never rest until we die. Sabbath dissolves the artificial urgency of our days because it liberates us from the need to be finished. I am somewhat to my surprise most mornings I'm getting up and looking in the mirror growing old. <laughs> but I can easily remember almost the exact moment when as a child time began to control my life. That is the moment I became conscious of time. I don't know exactly what age I was, perhaps six or seven, but I have a clear memory of standing in the dining room of our Fond du Lac Square home on Merrill Avenue, studying the turned over page of the St. Patrick's Parish calendar, calendar that hung on the wall there, when in a flash the meaning of all those squares and numbers became very clear to me. It must have been a day in mid or late August because I soon figured out that some, summer was coming to an end. School would be starting soon. And so I started keeping track of the passing days. It would be my last summer of what had seemed like endless days of outside play with the neighborhood gang, making up county fair type games in the backyard, charging a penny a piece to play, fishing for minnows under the Merrill Street Bridge with a stick for a pole and a bent pin for a hook, of playing kick the can and frying pan and statue until we were called in to eat or get ready for bed. I still did those things the next summer, and probably for one or two summers after that. But once I learned to read a calendar, summers had a beginning, a middle, and an end. I had entered the world of time. Today's service is about the Sabbath, but more especially about our relationship to time. Whether we mark time by the calendar on the wall, the clock on the stove, a wristwatch, or a smartphone, it seems it always goes too fast and there's never enough of it. Today, children, even small children, feel the pressure of their busy schedules with school, multiple sports, and lessons of various kinds. On the other end of the lifespan, people nearing the end of their busy careers and looking forward to the more leisurely pace of retirement will want to consider a comment on the retired life I heard recently from our retired friend, Dan Belzer. The Eco Food Committee of this fellowship was considering taking on a project that might be fairly demanding of our time. And before we got too far into the discussion, Dan said, look, some of you folks are still working, but I'm retired. I'm not sure I have that kind of time. <laughs> <laughs> Tongue-in-cheek, though it was, his comment is one to which many retired people can relate. If you are in the fortunate position of deciding for yourself how to spend your time, selecting from the many wonderful opportunities available to you may be a challenge, one which most people in the world would love to have, but a challenge nonetheless, lest we cram our lives with too much of a good thing. It can be really hard to just say no. In a book called Crazy Busy, the author Ed Hollowell helps us to understand the difference between good busy and crazy busy. He says, if you're busy doing what matters to you, then being busy is bliss. 
It's when busy keeps you from doing what matters most that we run into problems. In other words, one person's busyness is another person's bliss. But I have found from my own experience, and maybe you have too, that even if you're doing what matters to you, even if it's good volunteer work, if you're always feeling rushed, always in a hurry, always wanting to get on to the next thing because there are so many next things to get on to, emails and text messages, appointments, meetings, books, projects, etc., that kind of good busyness can be extremely stressful. In fact, Thomas Merton, the, P the Vietnam peace activist and Trappist monk, called that kind of overwork a violence. Here's what he says in his book, Seeds of Contemplation. There is a pervasive form of contemporary violence, and that is activism and overwork. Mm -hmm. The rush and pressure of modern life are a form, perhaps the most common form of innate violence. To allow oneself to be carried away by a multitude of conflicting concerns, to surrender to too many demands, to commit oneself to too many projects, to want to help everyone and everything is to succumb to violence. The frenzy of our activism neutralizes our work of peace. It destroys our inner capacity for peace. It destroys the fruitfulness of our own work because it kills the root of inner wisdom, which makes it fruitful. Pretty powerful words. And that book, by the way, was published in 1966. I wonder what he would say about today's lifestyle. <laughs> there was some interesting research done in the 70s on what is called the ethics of time. And the research question was, what makes a passerby decide whether to stop to help someone in distress? Is it a particular personality type or perhaps cultural conditioning? Or maybe it's the situation <coughs> itself. So the researchers recruited students from the Princeton Theological Seminary, thinking seminary students must certainly have pondered the parable of the Good Samaritan and made the message part of their lives. One by one, as they came in to be a part of the experiment, they were first tested for personality type. Then they were told that they were scheduled to give a talk. They told half of them the topic of their talk would in fact be a sermon on the Good Samaritan. They told the other half that they were to give a uh, talk on their job prospects after ordination. As each subject was about to leave to go to a building where their audience supposedly awaited, a researcher gave them a little more instruction. A third of them were told to hurry because they were already late. Another third were told they were right on schedule, but to go directly there so as not to keep the audience waiting. The last third were told that there was a slight delay in the proceedings, but that they should go on over anyway, taking their time if they wanted. As each student walked to the second building, they passed a man slumped against a doorway in an alley, and this, of course, was the real test. I read about this in a book about the Sabbath by uh, an author by the name of Judy Shulevitz, and here's what they found out in her words. As each student approached, the man coughed and groaned. If the student stopped, the man told them in a confused and groggy voice that he was fine, but he had a respiratory condition. He had taken medicine that would begin to work any minute now. If the student insisted on helping the man, he allowed himself to be taken into a building nearby. After the data was weighted and the variables analyzed, only one variable could be used to predict, predict who would stop to help and who wouldn't. The important factor was not personality type or whether a student's career or the parable of the Good Samaritan was foremost in his mind. It was whether or not what? He was in a hurry. So today we want to consider the Sabbath. Sabbath is a day of rest, a day set apart, a day to go to church perhaps, a day to come down off our ladders and wash out our paintbrushes, a day to close our laptops and get on our bikes or maybe our lawn chairs, a day to come together and make community with one another. In addition to thinking of the Sabbath as a day, we might also think of the Sabbath as a moment. That is, the Sabbath is a kind of metaphor for any time set apart from work. Time we take, or we might say take back, to
to renew our spirits. It can be anything, taking a walk, meditating, practicing yoga or Tai Chi, making music, dancing or singing, painting or writing. Whether a day or an hour or a moment, we can think of Sabbath time as a different order of time, a time outside our usual busy, hectic lives. And just like the Sabbath day, the Sabbath moment, I believe, has the potential to color, color the whole of our lives, to spill into the rest of our lives and make it richer, fuller, and deeper. We usually think of the Sabbath, the day, as a Jewish tradition, and indeed it has been for centuries, and still is central to the faith life of observant Jews, as we learned from Dr. Tom Ayala when he came to talk to Open Circle about the Sabbath he and his family observed. But even before Genesis and its creation story of God resting on the seventh day, the Babylonians celebrated a lunar Sabbath, also a day of rest. Buddhists, Christians, and Muslims all celebrate a cyclical Sabbath. We too come together on Sundays to reflect on those questions, the creation story in Genesis, and the multitude of other creation narratives address. The questions people from all cultures for all time have asked. Where do we come from? Why are we here? What matters? What is the meaning of life? How do we love? How do we deal with all the heartbreak and grief and pain in the world and in our personal lives? What is right conduct? Entering these deep waters of the soul, Sunday after Sunday, week after week, year after year, and ultimately celebrating the mystery of it all is what Wayne Muller in his book Sabbath calls a pearl of great price. He says, you're not going anywhere. Millions have done this before you and millions will do it after you are gone. When you drink this cup, light the candle, recite this prayer, there is sacredness and magic in it. It is a gift for you to help you remember who you are and to whom you belong, come and take your rest. I would like to suggest that there might be something to the obligatory Jewish Sabbath and the obligatory Sunday Mass. Not the obligatory part so much as the habit of a weekly Sabbath. There's a whole science of habit today, and all the research helps us understand what we already know, but perhaps don't think about a whole lot, that our habits either help or hinder us in living the lives we want to live. It is our habits that shape our lives and even our brains, we're finding out. So in this highly charged, ever faster, information exploding, highly distracting and absolutely fascinating world we inhabit today, we might consider making it a habit to take time out one day a week to bring ourselves back to those big questions, all of which can be summed up in one question, how then shall we live? The big stuff of life that is so often and so easily swamped by what Stephen Covey called the merely urgent matters of our daily lives. Are we about the things we want to be about? To ponder these things together and support one another's journeys and celebrate the deep, deep mystery of life together in blessed community, that wonderful old churchy phrase, as we try to do here each Sunday, is surely a pearl of great price. And the rest of the week, I think Ned Holloway nails it in that book, Crazy Busy, which is subtitled, Overstretched, Overbooked, and About to Snap. Here's how he describes what happened to the typical American family starting a decade or two ago. If you feel busier now than you've ever been before and you wonder if you can keep up this pace much longer, don't feel alone. Most of us feel slightly bewildered, realizing we have more to do than ever with less time to do it. Others created this lifestyle, looked like the way to go, the way of the future. What were you supposed to do, be a Luddite? and refuse to buy a cell phone or a Blackberry and not go wireless, refuse to enroll your kids in soccer, violin, and SAT tutoring, refuse to take on the added debt of the extra week of vacation your spouse and kids were looking forward to, 
have simple birthday parties the way they used to do in the 1950s and 1960s, figure out a way to live with just one car or just two, say no to braces for your daughter, let your yard go to seed, refuse to give your time to the uh, cancer foundation your friend is heading up, refuse to do the extra work your boss asks you to do because half your staff got laid off. What if you're next? Being too busy, he says, can become a habit so entrenched that it leads you to postpone or cut short what really matters to you, making you a slave to a lifestyle you don't like but can't escape. You can be so busy that you don't even take the time to decide what actually does matter most to you, let alone make the time to do it. I think many of our families today can identify. So what to do? Well, he has a number of suggestions in the book, probably none of which will <clears throat> fundamentally change things for most people, but some of which might help. For example, one suggestion is to get control of what he calls screen sucking. It almost certainly does make sense to look at that as well as the other ways we might manage our time better, but that's another topic altogether. However, the Sabbath suggests a different approach, and that is taking time out, slowing down in the middle of the frenzy. So one of the questions which intrigues me and has for some time is how might this kind of stopping on purpose, what I'm calling Sabbath moments, become practices? That is, habits with the potential to enrich our lives and nurture our inner peace in such a way that it becomes a gift to our families and friends and community and indeed the world because it infuses all our work. When I think of that kind of peace, one person that comes to mind is a waitress who works at Cedar Lodge Restaurant, a restaurant that probably many of you have been to. Now, if you've ever waited tables, you know how hectic and chaotic that can be when it's busy, <coughs> crazy busy, which Cedar Lodge almost always is. And if you've ever waited tables, you know customers, especially if they've been at the bar for a while, a long while and not always nice. I speak from experience, waitressing experience. <laughs> well, maybe, no, okay. <laughs> now, I don't know this waitress at all, but I've observed her for a number of years. And she moves through that crowded, noisy little restaurant in a cloud of palpable peace, which is quite remarkable, especially given the pace of her work. My eye doctor in Milwaukee gives off that same aura. I love to be in her presence. And I'm sure you all know people like this. So Sabbath moments are practices that nurture inner peace. What do you do? This might be a wonderful opportunity for us to share some personal Sabbath experiences. We might have a few minutes for that, that we find helpful once we may have stumbled onto that are uniquely our own, or perhaps tried and true practices from the wisdom tradition, uh, various wisdom traditions. So I'll start out beside the microphone. So I find uh, a lot of Sabbath moments by paying attention on purpose, especially to sights, uh, sounds, tastes, textures, etc. just the everyday stuff of life. And I'll give you one little example. This is a practice um, we sometimes do when we sit down to eat. Um, and before we, set, before we do, uh, begin the meal, we set the timer on my iPhone for two minutes. Just put it right there on the table. And for those two minutes, we just eat and focus on the food. We don't talk. Two things happen uh, usually. First, time slows down. Two minutes seems like more than two minutes. And second, we can really appreciate the flavors in the food, how it feels in the mouth, how it looks. Have you ever noticed, for example, how gorgeous a mound of deep yellow butternut squash looks next to some broccoli that's just steamed a little, so it's this beautiful grass green? Not that all our meals are beautiful or even great tasting. In fact, I've served my fair share of mediocre dinners and, and even, you know, worse. But here's the thing. <laughs> We're there for it. We've shown up in the moment and that I think is a habit worth cultivating. We've been doing this for a couple of months now and not at every meal or even every day, 
but fairly often. And you know, while it feels a little contrived for sure, there's peace and pleasure in that time out, what I would call a Sabbath moment, one that reminds us to pay attention to and appreciate all our food more, even when we don't set the timer. So I'm hoping we can take just a few minutes now and um, ask if you might consider sharing what you could call Sabbath moments.